I've talked with veterans who just have a bucket, you know, a yes. bucket of medications. Cognitive behavioral therapy is offered. Uh, doesn't mean people are getting it. Um, a lot of VAs do have things like acupuncture, um, other kinds of group therapies and such. But you know what they don't often offer are some of the treatments that you and I know about and are trying to bring out to the, yes. to the community, the stellate ganglion block therapies, the ketamine therapies, the Definitely psychedelic talk therapies, about that. the hyperbaric yes. oxygen therapy, and and more. And so, like, but it gets back to the question of how is somebody going to get better when they're being paid to be sick? <laughs> Thank you to Vivo Health for sponsoring this episode of the show. I love Vivo Barefoot Shoes. I use them in my training and everyday life. They have helped my feet get stronger. Vivo Barefoot is on a mission to create regenerative footwear that brings you closer to nature. What do I mean by this? I mean, these shoes are flat. They feel great. You can almost sense the ground underneath you as opposed to big clunky shoes. They've really helped my performance. They have a great range of shoes from kids to adults for any kind of activity, whether it's hiking or training. And again, I use mine every day. Vivo Barefoot uses sustainably sourced natural material. These materials are all recycled, so I feel good about them. Vivo Barefoot has offered my listeners, 20% off if you would like to try them for yourself. I know that you will love them. You can use the code Dr. Lion 20 That's Dr. Lion 20 for 20% off. And I have to tell you, we talk all about body strength, but foot strength matters as well. And these shoes can increase your foot strength by 60% in a matter of months. Go to vivobarefoot.com, use the code DRLION20 for 20% off. That's vivobarefoot.com. I'm going to say Dr. Chris Free. Yeah. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm thrilled to have you on yeah. to discuss your work, your work on operator syndrome, which you have done a tremendous amount for the community. And when I say community, I'm talking about special operations, which we will cover all of those individuals and their families. And also, if you are listening to this podcast and you're thinking, I am not a military operator, I am not a first responder, the chances are you are still under a large amount of stress. And what you will hear today will help you regardless of the domain in which you are functioning. Is that fair to say? Well, it sure could be, depending on where we take the conversation. My my first, I mean, 32 years of my career, I, I worked at the VA for 15 years. And so I have a large history of uh, published research with PTSD and depression and anxiety disorders. And, and so uh, really that's been the entire focus of my career. Um, now much more of a physiological emphasis on the types of other injuries that just too often don't get talked about or looked at or or even thought of. So part of what part I guess part of my the message and the point of my book is to is to try to make the point that too often we've relied on the PTSD as the easy button. Certainly the VA does that, many healthcare systems, you have stress, you have trauma, boom, when they mm -hmm. hit that, that red PTSD button without ever looking at your hormones, without ever looking at your the you know assessing you for chronic pain um, without ever thinking about the damage that you you may have sustained to your brain through sports or training or you know of course military um, activities or or drinking or you know diving or other things that that we we do that hammers our brain. Mm. And you are a PhD, and you have published quite a bit on the area in in the area of PTSD just quickly because i think it's important for context how is PTSD defined how do i define it or how does the <laughs> APA define it so let's talk about the standard APA the american uh psychiatric, psychiatric association yeah. that would be a clinical definition or what we would consider an right. international classification of disease icd10 code how is that typically defined well, it's it. There's a formal definition. It is. It has evolved, and we could go back 
historically, if you want, but I'll, I'll, I'll touch on what it is, how it's defined now. Um, PTSD, the diagnosis, was codified in 1980 for the first time in the DSM-3 three edition. They changed it in 94. It was changed in 94 uh, for the fourth edition, and it was changed again in 2013 in the fifth edition. Hmm. And the changes are, we could quibble about how significant they are. I think most people would say they don't really fundamentally change the diagnosis. So the diagnosis is first and foremost, a trauma, and that trauma has to be identified, and it has to be something that fits kind of within the definition of a trauma which is part of the problem with the diagnosis. And how, what do you mean? Because trauma is different for everybody? Well, the, the, the old definition of a trauma was something that was outside the range of normal human experience, something that involved uh, experiencing or witnessing a life-threatening um, event, potentially life-threatening event. Um, it, was writ it was initially thought of as, you know, the, the types of events that were thought of were physical and sexual assault, domestic violence, combat, motor vehicle accidents, and severe life-threatening uh, health, 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 abrupt health problems. Like a cancer diagnosis would be considered? Not really. Like maybe surviving a, a cardiac heart attack and, and being resuscitated. I mean, it, it's, it's not really crystal clear what where we kind of draw the boundaries. There was another p part of DSM-3 uh, that involved f the experience at the time of the trauma of fear, helplessness, or horror. Fear, and for the listener, DSM, did you say DSM-3? That was the third edition in 1980, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. For psychiatry and psychology. It's for, of, psychi of psychiatric. psychiatric disorders. I see. Psychi psychiatric disorders. And it's interesting because PTSD also has an ICD-10 mm -hmm. diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we have a diagnosis from the medical aspect, meaning potentially, again, with PTSD, they might see an increase in blood pressure, right? Mm -hmm. There are objective measures mm -hmm. from um, what I have read and what when we diagnose people, there's the objective measures and then the psychiatric diagnoses. Yeah, yeah, right. Interesting. So, so just to just to help listeners kind of track this, the ICD is the International Class Classification, and that includes every possible illness in medicine, everything. This the APA's uh, DSM is only psychiatric disorders, and it's put out by the American Psychiatric uh, Association. Now, it's it's the the work that that goes into that is is multidisciplinary. So there are psychologists and social workers and you know nurses and people with other expertise who are on the task forces that that, that define and 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 revise this at every every new edition. But is, but it's primary it's primarily psychiatric. And I want to also lay the foundation. It's this is interesting because this is a little rogue. This conversation operator syndrome. Um, and we're going to talk about it because this does challenge our belief about the framework of PTSD and what individuals in austere or extreme, we can say allostatic load environments are and is. And by the way, you have an interesting background that your father was a, a U.S. Air Force physician mm -hmm. and a Vietnam veteran. Mm -hmm. You also... um have again you had mentioned worked as a therapist at the veteran affairs you uh got your doctorate in clinical psychology in 1992 you have spent a long time serving this community and you are um and have held a tenured professorship at two medical schools a state university and you have, have received millions of dollars in federal grants directing large research programs you've also by the way incredibly humble have published over 300 Scientific articles. Did I miss anything? Oh, wait. And one was a, a graduate textbook in uh, psychopathology. Yeah. Wow. You got it. So it sounds like you're just not busy or motivated. <laughs> well, um, I think part of what. Thank you. That was very gracious to kind of run through all that. I think part of part of what you're what you're establishing is I do have kind of the an academic history and credibility as a somebody working within. The structure and framework of established medicine and, and academia. Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit out 
out of, I mean, I'm a little bit on the fringe of that now with some, my, some of my criticisms of, of the field and of some of the systems. Um, I, I do get some, you know, some arrows and some stink eye from certain quarters, uh, these days. Actually, I always have. <laughs> I always have. My, fa but. my favorite kind of academic. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, what are some of the criticisms of the work that you have put forth? My work? Yes. Or let me ask it in a different way. Typically, when an individual challenges the framework yeah. of something that has been established for a period of time, it is very uncomfortable for other individuals in the field, whether they are providers in any aspect. And I really think that you have done a, a fantastic job at challenging the narrative uh, and the view and the lens through which we view PTSD, operator syndrome, um, which you coined that term. Uh, in, a, in a medical paper, yes. We, we used the, we titled a medical paper, Operator Syndrome, and it wasn't just me. I have a, a strong list of, of co-authors, including Morgan Luttrell, who was a doctoral student at, uh, at, at UT Dallas at the time, uh, former Navy SEAL. And, but it I was love a, his wife, by the way, Leslie. Shout out to you. Uh, she's awesome. Yep, agree. And um, but, but it wasn't a phrase, I don't even know where the phrase came from. I'm going to just be very, very blunt. I don't remember. At some point, it became a phrase I was using in mm -hmm. my head. But I also heard other people in the community. I heard other doctors. I heard other psychologists, other psychiatrists using either that phrase or different, you know, similar phrase. Kirk Parsley, our colleague Kirk Parsley, yes. uh, was, was using the phrase SEAL syndrome for, he's a former Navy SEAL who continued to work with Kirk SEALs. Kirk is a very dear friend of this podcast. Yes. And he, he was, you know, listening to him, he said, I've been using the phrase SEAL syndrome for probably 20, 24 years, uh, 25 years. So, mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just an easy phrase that just you know comes immediately to mind when you're when you kind of look at at the things we're talking about. And can you lay out the picture again of what we understand and believe um, to be? And I, I guess I'm honing in on PTSD because I wouldn't know a different way to think about the transition from PTSD to operator syndrome. Okay. Okay. So maybe you can help sure. me bridge the gap between in a for the listener to understand what we are about to dive into. Okay. So um, if you'll be patient with me, let me go back to the question of what is PTSD. So trauma uh, is one top thing. That's They call that the criterion A. B are a variety of symptoms of re-experiencing that trauma. So nightmares, intrusive thoughts, for example, being... Um, hearing a helicopter fly overhead and having memories and feelings triggered by that would be an example. The C symptoms um, or the B symptoms are would be the avoidance. So classic aspect of all anxiety disorders is if something frightens you, you avoid it or you escape it if you're if it if it comes along. If you're frightened of spiders, what do you do? You avoid spiders. Um, I've known people with phobia, like cock. I have a, had a colleague years ago who had a cockroach phobia. That's a good phobia. Yeah, and and she was here in Houston, and she was like, "I'm not staying in Houston. I'm leaving." <laughs> she, yes, I have seen cockroaches here in Houston. Yeah, I if I had a phobia, I would also leave. Yeah, they're like that big. Um, some of them. Yes. And and she, uh, she, I mean, she understood the behavioral principles of how to treat a phobia, but she's like, I ain't, I'm not going to do that. I'm I'm moving to Boston. So she so she moved to Boston. Um, that's a classic avoidance. But when we avoid things, we never get over our fears. And I mean, it's just a basic physiological principle of habituation. When I was in my early 20, when I was in my teens and early 20s, I had a very powerful fear of public speaking social anxiety, terrified. I avoided it at all costs, got all the way through college without ever having to get up in front of a group of people and talk until I got to graduate school. And my second year of graduate school, they said, you're teaching a class. There's 350 students that you're going to go teach developmental psychology to. And, you know, I had a choice. I, I avoid or I drop out of school, you know, I do it or I drop out of school essentially. And, you know, 30 years later, I, I don't have any anxiety about public speaking. If mm -hmm. you if you face it and you deal with it and you, and you just it's that exposure. You don't have to get good at it. You just have to do it and then and then so cluster B A B C symptoms are are the avoidance and then the D symptoms are the emotional things, self-blame, anger, arousal, 
of the, the, the hypervigilance, the, you know, there's a lot of things um, that include things like self-destructive behaviors, risky behaviors. Mm -hmm. So that, that's our diagnosis of PTSD. Now, since I'm on a roll, I'll, I'll give you Keep my- Keep going. I'll we'll give, take it. I'll give you my definition. PTSD uh, is essentially a combination of anxiety and, and depression and specific focus on the fear reactivity. So jumping out of airplanes, you had a traumatic experience and it terrifies you now, you don't do it. You stay away from jumping out of airplanes. Um, that fear reactivity is kind of the defining feature of, of PTSD. Hmm. And that would be, for example, also if someone got into a car accident um, while they were driving and they chose not to drive right. again, that, right. that's a fear reactivity. Right. Okay. And, you know, we could go, we go back to... We have a long conversation about the VA system where I worked and, and kind of some of the things I was seeing and, and, and trying to put forth then. But essentially, it, comes, it, it becomes kind of simple. The VA has put the emphasis on PTSD as the go-to diagnoses for soldiers. Do you know how many soldiers and how many veterans are diagnosed with PTSD? I can give you uh, two separate data points. Okay. I, I love them. One is the epidemiological data. This is the very rigorous data. Uh, with large, you know, um, sample sizes, multiple studies that is kind of disconnected from systemic factors, you get a rate in soldiers of about 8%. 8%. And what is the rate in a general population? Do we know maybe? 6%. Ma okay. I was going to say, Matthew, why don't you look that up? <laughs> Be my Jamie. Uh, it's about 6%. Okay, 6%. So 2% increase in... But if you go to the VA... Mm -hmm. And you and you look at a VA, you know, people that use the VA. We now know that the GWAT veterans, the Just rate, the global global war on, war on terror yeah. veterans. So the veterans that served in Iraq and Afghanistan, for the most part, have a fifty percent, fifty percent diagnosis of PTSD. Of PTSD. Well, you, you ever take Econ one hundred and one? I never, no. I never did either. <laughs> but but no. one, one of the principles of Econ one hundred and one overlaps with some of the basic principles of psychology, which is when you when you offer a reinforcement for something for mm -hmm. a behavior, you get more of that behavior. Give me an example um, uh, so, of how that so the, translates. Yeah, so the VA provides disability cash payments that are essentially lifetime yes. to soldiers to veterans who have who have PTSD, and so you end up with a. a, a a PTSD rate of 50% in the VA. Uh, maybe it's high. It's probably higher now. It's, it's, it, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably higher. So when I worked in the VA, which was 92 to 2006, um, part of what I saw and part of what I tried to talk about and some of my research followed on was the idea that, first of all, does it even make sense to consider you as an invalid because you have a psychiatric disorder? I see. That's that's actually interesting. And if what I'm hearing you say is that in order to get disability, you must qualify for disability. Yes. In order to qualify for disability, you must have a certain percentage of, quote, illnesses that make you disabled, whether right. it is sleep apnea, PTSD, et cetera. Right. Okay. Whatever injuries or illnesses you have that you that developed while you were in service, um, are identified, um, evaluated, and there are there's different numbers, different percent ratings. It's a zero to hundred percent total approach, but they give different num percentages to different disorders based on their severity. So you have over half of all of the veterans from the last twenty five years receiving VA disability payments for PTSD. Now. Just, I, I got to say this before the hate mail starts to come at me. I've, I've, I've received my share of this over the years. I'm not anti-veteran. I hope that's of course I hope not. That's clear, and I'm not here to take away veterans' benefits. I think we need to do a lot for our veterans. Every veteran who put on a uniform um, d deserves a good life and deserves to be honored and revered and respected for what they've done. But to say to you. Or to to Matthew, over Matthew there. our producer, that you're a veteran, and you you know since you have some some symptoms of anxiety and depression, we're going to send you a check for the rest of your life. And and do you also feel that it labels individuals uh, deeper 
where they then identify with this idea well, of having PTSD. Well, think about the message that sends. What's I, the ex what's the exp agree. expectation? You go, wow, the VA is going to send me a check for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm probably never going to get better. So I think it's a tragic message to send. And these are treatable conditions. Civilians, civilians with PTSD or depression or anxiety who receive treatment typically either get all the way better or they get much, much, much better. So the symptom improvement, the functional, uh, and the improvement in functioning uh, is, is significant. So one question is, does it make sense to pay people to be sick? What message does that send? What is that doing to their own psyche? Because we're sending them a horrible message. You know, you're now a psychiatric invalid. Hmm. Um, when we should be providing treatment. And now you, you flip to, 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 to the other piece of this and you say, well, how much money does VA spend on, on mental health treatment programs a year? I think it's 14%. Hmm. I'm sorry, 14 billion. billion. Yeah. They have no administrative data at the VA to support that veterans are getting better from their healthcare programs. And in the general population, treatments for PTSD would be, are, do you know how, how they're being treated? Is it medication? Is it cognitive behavioral therapy? Is it group support? Is it more holistic? It's all, it's all of that. It's all of that. Here's a bolt, but it's, it's heavily medication. So heavily medication. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's a medication to sleep, one or two antidepressants, maybe a mood stabilizer. For everybody. Or, well, or everybody's or different, yeah. but a very common pattern is to start you with one or two things, and then a week, a month, six months later, maybe add a few more. I've talked with veterans who just have a bucket, you know, a yes. bucket of medications. Cognitive behavioral therapy is offered. Uh, doesn't mean people are getting it. Um, a lot of VAs do have things like acupuncture, um, other kinds of group therapies and such, but you know what they don't often offer are some of the treatments that you and I know about and are trying to bring out to the, yes. to the community, the stellate ganglion block therapies, the ketamine therapies, the Definitely psychedelic talk therapies, about that. the yes. hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and, and more. And so, like, but it gets back to the question of how is somebody going to get better when they're being paid to be sick? Thank you to Thesis for sponsoring this episode of the show. Thesis is the world's first customized nootropic company. I've mentioned this in the past. I only promote products that I use. These have been a game changer for me. Nootropics are nutrients found in nature or the human body. They enhance cognitive function. Who doesn't want more focus, more energy, or a better mood? I don't know one person who doesn't want more of those things. Many companies take a one-size-fits-all approach what I love about Thesis, not only are their blends exceptional, but you can go to their website, which is takethesis.com. You'll take a quiz. They will then send you a starter kit with four different blend recommendations to try over the course of a month. This is personalized. Thesis also offers, are you ready for this? free consultations with a wellness coach to optimize your experience and dial in on your favorite formulas. These products have absolutely been life-changing for me. These blends are blends you have never seen before. Go to takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion and you'll get 10% off your first box. Takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion. Take the quiz and you are on your way to more energy and more focus. That's a, a great point, and I and I really believe that that extends beyond the VA. So that is it does it is it does we see that um, you know when I did when I trained in psychiatry, when an individual is on disability, there it really limits. And again, we are not saying that disability is bad. There are people that need it absolutely, but from a total functioning perspective in the world, uh, I believe that there can be more support. And I want to read something from your book. And this is uh, a, a short little paragraph in your book. And it says, I believe it is time we switch this foregrounded emphasis on psychiatric illness with the overlooked background of physiological injuries, chronic medical conditions, and social challenges. Against traditional diagnoses and treatments, my opinion may seem counterintuitive, 
but I believe that an exclusive focus on psychiatric disorders fails to address many of the root causes of mounting special operation forces suicides. Wow. Well done, sir. This is tremendous. And again, I know many of the people listening are not in the special operations community. While this discussion will be largely focused on the soldiers, please be listening as many of these pillars of operator syndrome can also be instituted and evolved in your own life from sleep, from hormones, to environmental exposures, to community and connection. And we are going to dive into all of those things. This is a bold book. This is a bold book. For the idea of operator syndrome, did you have a moment, an aha moment that changed the way you thought? I did. I did. I don't know. I don't know that I could pinpoint the exact moment, but I can kind of describe describe, I don't, I don't know the date. <laughs> I didn't memorialize it on a calendar, but uh, probably about a decade ago, there were, I had a, a friend here in Houston uh, when I was working here and he was a former Navy SEAL. He had been at one of the, you know, the he'd been at the tier one unit of Naval Special Warfare. So for those of you listening, let's um, clarify that. That would be DevGrew. DevGrew, but you probably, you probably need to clarify that <laughs> for many people. <laughs> and that would be what you hear as SEAL Team 6. Yeah. And he'd been a lot on many of the famous missions, missions that movies have been made out of. And there was he, he, he and a couple other guys who were also operators, a couple guys from the army, um, SF, and then later kind of figured out they were also at some of the tier, tier, un, tier one units. Um, and when I was first introduced to them by another mutual friend, the conversation was, hey, Dr. Freeze over here, you know some stuff about PTSD. Why don't you guys go have coffee or get a beer and just have some conversations? And that, that's kind of where things started. The In medicine, we talk about the presenting complaint. What's the com presenting complaint? The presenting complaint was, man, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't feel like myself anymore. And I look in the mirror and I don't look like myself anymore. So in, in my brilliant mind, I'm thinking, well, you know, I've always been a critic of PTSD, but it sounds like depression and anxiety and PTSD. So let's let's start there. Which you are, which you are very skilled at diagnosing. That's, yes, yes. And, that's and, why no one wants to talk to you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's people do. People will talk to you. Meeting, they don't want to be diagnosed by you, but yes. So so we start this conversation and and pretty quickly what I noticed in these guys who who, you know, these utterly fearless men who've who've been to hell and back, so to speak. Do not, uh, yes, they had depression. Yes, there was some very general anxiety, but there wasn't the fear reactivity youth you would expect to see with PTSD. They weren't avoiding shooting. They weren't avoiding activities like diving or jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. They liked doing those things. They enjoyed doing those things. They, you know, that, that was home to them. I know, it sounds crazy. And, and they weren't crazy, um, but they did have some other things going on and it got to a pretty quickly got to the point where I where I was like, okay, something this is something different and I don't know what it is. Was it because they didn't have that fear reactivity? Syndrome? They didn't have the fear reactivity and they didn't have the 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 avoidance. They didn't they didn't show any, you know, they would do anything. Hey, you want to go, you know, play with any kind of military thing or even conversations. Tell me about your, you know, tell you tell me about your most horrific traumatic memory and they could just very easily talk about that with no increase in their in their pulse. No increase in pulse or blood pressure. No, none of the physiological arousal that you, that you would, you would typically you, expect. You would expect. So then it was, huh? Okay, let's let's get a sleep study. I was astounded that that these guys, they all all of them had sleep apnea. Every single every one single of, one of yes, them. Yes, every operator in our clinic that we get. Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea. It's almost like a hundred percent. Yes. Then I said, "Well, let's get a let's. I've never had never done this before, but let's get a blood draw and see what your hormones look like." Why did you think about sleep apnea at the time? Because that was ten years ago, and it's really been popularized now. Um, and you know, again, we work on the same Seal Future Foundation together on the medical board. It has really seen an uptick in even mm -hmm. question or diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Why at that time did you even think about that? 
uh, I didn't think about sleep apnea, but the sleep was so jacked up. Uh, and I was just like, we got to figure out what's going on here. There's something here. I don't know what it is. I can't talk to you. None of nobody was wearing, you know, Fitbits or wearables back then to get sleep data. So it was really hard to figure out the sleep. So let's get a sleep study. And then it came back. What sleep apnea? You're not a middle aged, overweight man. You're right. you're a 35 year old stud. Why? How how do you have sleep apnea? Then we got the, hor then I, you know, let's get the hormones checked. And suddenly it's like, wait, what? Low testosterone? You have the hormonal status of a 13-year-old girl. Or a 95-year-old man. Fair, fair. Um, and, and yes, I mean, horrific. It's like, wow, that low testosterone right there accounts for the poor, accounts a lot for poor sleep, depression, low motivation, irritability, uh, poor concentration, um, personality alterations or what seem like personality alterations. Hmm. 30, how many years have I been in academic medicine? In the, and I'm gonna say I've been a part of three psychiatry departments, the Medical University of South Carolina, Baylor College of Medicine, and here in Houston, University of Texas, uh, medical school here in Houston. I don't think we had, as far as I know, I mean, it's possible I was uninformed about something, as far as I know, there was no endocrinologist or urologist in the faculty on our departments. Not for, one. Oh, that's interesting. Not for, one. Not one. For psychiatry. For psychiatry. Now, these are large, multidisciplinary departments. Um, and that means that when you say multidisciplinary, that means you have psychiatry, neurology, who else? Psychology. Social work. Nursing, social work, genetic. We had geneticists, really? um, neuroimagers, um, neuropsychologists. Um, we, we even had in, you know, um, internal medicine uh, docs. But as far as I know, we didn't have a single endocrinologist or urologist. And so then you, then you say, and this is another piece of my experience at the VA, we never, I never once referred um, somebody to have their hormones checked. It's just not what mental health care does. Maybe on a very rare you know, kind of exceptional basis. I think it should be part of routine care. It should be. And really what you're highlighting here is that typically a diagnosis is given and the symptoms of, say, depression would be, right, low mood, anhedonia, not doing what you used to like, um, low energy, cognitive impairment. All self-report. All, right, all self-reported. All subjective self-report. No the, blood tests, right. no lab lab values of anything. As to opposed at. to thinking about the subjective reporting coming from something else, and you do a beautiful job explaining this in the book, coming from physiological uh, or pathophysiological mechanisms outside of mm -hmm. the brain. Right. I mean, I guess suppose uh, essentially um, hormonal imbalances or, or hormonal dysfunction would be coming from the brain, but uh, you understand what I'm saying is that it wasn't even addressed, which- It wasn't even thought of. I know, which, for example, if someone has very low T, you know, um, just even one of my patients the other day was feeling, quote, depressed recently mm -hmm. because they had gone off of their hormone replacement therapy. We put them back on. I'm back to feeling like myself. Yeah, yeah. And and now imagine that imagine those soldiers who with low testosterone who are being told by the medical establishment your problem is depression here's your SSRI medication here's your antidepressant medication now that I mean it might help them sleep a little bit better which could help their testosterone a little come back a little bit but that's not really treating the root cause of the problems that they're having mm -hmm. and we somehow re just medicine refuses to do this broadly I don't well I don't get it. We're getting there. Good. We're doing it. Good. One other thing um, about about this early, these early guys where I'm just learning. I just like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's just uh, like I'm I'm in there with a stick, just pro poking and probing, trying to figure some things out. I was director of the of the Menninger, uh, the, I was director of research at the Menninger Clinic here in town at that time, which is affiliated with Baylor College of Medicine. And we had a, we had a research protocol that we could bring people in and have and do a, a neuroimaging of their brain. So we were doing fMRI brain scans. And then I would take th take these 
um, scans over to my neurologist friend, Ben Weinstein, who's now at Houston Method, Method, Methodist Hospital, and he's a, he's a co-author in the paper. And we would sit down and look at these after hours. And he was just like, who is this guy? Like, I didn't even tell him what, what he was looking at. He's like, this guy looks, he's scrolling through the brain. You know, you can get the three-dimensional yeah. images. And he goes, well, there's a lot of atrophy in the ventricles, a lot of atrophy. He goes, but there, I don't see any gross lesions or... Um, tumors or any, you know, anything that would strike you as a, as a, you know, a specific type of injury, just this general atrophy. And he goes, this, this, pro this person's probably 70 years old, just based on the, on the, on the ventricles. And what would the ven uh, ventricle atrophy, how would that translate to what a clinical picture is? Is there even a, a translation to that? Because I know the brain has the default mode network and it really works in this kind of circuit, but I'm outside my area of expertise here, but, but, you know, what he said is this looks like a, a 70 year old man who's going to have cognitive problems, memory problems, concentration problems. And he was astonished when I said, this individual brain is 37 years old. Like I had to actually persuade him. I wasn't just messing with him. You guys just weren't eating Chinese food in the I, office I, after hours, right? I, I slamming mean, the shots, looking at brains. We weren't. There were no shots. <laughs> and that that came later, maybe. Yeah. But but you yeah. know, we both have kind of dry sense of humor, and he thought I was joking. And was that the moment? Collectively, all of this, and there was at some point a wait a minute. This is not simply a psychiatric problem. Yes, psych psychiatric problems, depression, anxiety, anger. PTSD, addiction are all important parts of the bigger picture. But if we're, we have to talk about traumatic brain injury, we have to assume traumatic brain injury um, in military special operators. We have to assume hormonal dysfunctions. We have to assume severe sleep problems, insomnia plus the apnea. We have to assume chronic pain and, you, and, and the headaches uh, that go with TBI. I mean, you know, chronic pain, you know, these guys have pain in their, in their shoulders, neck, hips, back, elbows, wrists. Uh, I did, I, I did the Murph challenge a few years ago, <laughs> stupidest, most intense thing <laughs> I ever wait, tried. What, so what is, what, talk about what Murph is. Oh, the Murph. Well, it's a, it named after, um, Michael, Michael, Murphy. Michael Murphy, who, who was, who, who was killed in action on, at Operation Red Wings. And the story is, I don't know what's true or not, but the story is this was his favorite workout. You put on a 20, you put on your body armor. I wore a 20 pound vest. You run a mile, hundred pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 air squats, and then you run another mile. And then you hope you have a good place to collapse. And you're trying to do that for time. My elbows like wouldn't work for two weeks. Like how, what is a good Murph time? Good Murph time. And and what did you do it in? Oh, man, you're going to put me on the spot. Well, I'm very proud of my Murph time, actually. I think 75 minutes is the, is kind of the, the, the min, you know, is like, like you better get it done. You better get it done in 75 okay. minutes if you're, if you're serious. I think the guys I know do it like anywhere from 35 to 55 minutes, depending on, on their age and their, their level of training. I did it in 72 minutes, seven, two. So I, I did squeeze it in, in that, in that time. And, and, uh, but my elbows, it took them a few weeks to forgive me. So the chronic pain, uh, that we see in the community, um, that's why we need the, the functional medicine is so important for them. Where do they get that? They're not getting that, uh, routinely. Active not, duty is not getting that. They're not, neither are, neither are retired or separated. Um, well, we're working to change that. We are, we are, and we, I hope we're going to get to that. But um, you have right here in front of you, I have, uh, and this is also in the book, yes. but it wasn't written for the book, is a, is a very short one page scale titled the Operator Syndrome Scale that just lists all of these different conditions. And an important point I want to kind of emphasize here is these are interconnected. And so we in modern medicine, I think we often fail when we don't consider the entire picture. Your TBI is connected to your, your, your hormonal functioning, your hormonal functioning and your sleep and your chronic pain. There, there, there's all these interlinkages. All of your body systems affect each other. You have problems in one part of your body, it cascades into every other system. Yes. And I'm just going to read a couple of these because it's important. Now, number one here is, and you guys can, when you get the book, you'll be able to see it. It says traumatic brain injury. Now, I will say this because many individuals 
operator or non-operator have had traumatic brain injuries without knowledge of having it. Yes. I would likely say, and again, this is my perspective, I don't have numbers, it's more common than not. Could it have been falling off of your bike at 15 years old? Could you have been a high school cheerleader who fell and hit her head? Or let's say you played football. There's so, even ricocheted um, from using a weapon. Small, um, again, small jerking motions. There's many ways individuals could have a traumatic brain injury. Would you agree with that? I would. And and when you're talking about certain occupations, such as operators, firefighters, um, you have even more. I mean, the the blast exposures, for example, in training that 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 many veterans go through, the shoulder fired rockets, the breaching, the demolitions, the jumping out of airplanes, the rappelling, the diving, you know, oxygen depletion types of things. But but just for most people to understand, there, there's two sort of very large categories of TBI. One are one are the concussive impact forces. That's when you know your head something hits your head or your head hits something and it rattles and bru- inside your skull and bruises. And for the doctors listening, that would be the coup counter coup injury. Mm-hmm. Then there you have another type of injury which we're just starting to kind of tune into. And and I don't know when we first put this on the map, but the first paper I read that really kind of defined the injury based on postmortem studies was 2016. Blast injuries have caused a shearing force that goes through, shears through the soft tissue in the body. So it's a different type of brain injury than a concussive impact force. And that w- is that the... Um... Is that the encephalopathy, the um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Well, that was named in, after uh, Benny Damalu was looking at the mm. the postmortem, doing postmortem studies in his kitchen of brains of people who were football players, Dude, boxers. Do not go to that guy's house. Ooh, or at least for dinner <laughs> or breakfast. Uh, Daniel Pearl and his group at at Walter Reed started, you know, they they kind of replicated the postmortem studies, and they they and but they started looking for other things. And they used different staining um, technologies, and they found a different pattern. So it's di- so is the CTE different than the shearing force yes, injury? Yes, yeah. So the CTE, the what they find is a buildup of tau proteins, TAU proteins in the brain. On the for the blast wave injuries or blast wave exposures, w- what they found was a scarring pattern in the glial cells of the brain. So the glial cells are the the support cells of the neurons. So for every neuron in your brain, those are the messenger cells. You have ten glial cells that hold them in place, insulate them, help help clean them. So the glial cells were being scarred, and they called that. In, uh, Dr. Pearl and his group named that interface astroglial scarring mm. in 2016. So a recent diagnosis or a recent naming of this. And there's no way someone could. So you did an fMRI study of one of the tier one operators at 37 years old, 37 years old had ventricle atrophy. An individual would not be able to see the Mm-mm. shearing force injury, Correct. which I think is important right. to mention. Right. That there's a lot of injuries, again, whether you're an operator, whether you have risk-taking behaviors, whether you're jumping out of an airplane, whether you're doing any kind of activity which can damage the brain, you may or may not see that. Right. Yep. You can't see it. Um, and and so, I mean, this has been something that's just haunted um, athletes and veterans for, you know, for the last 15, 20 years is there may be these invisible injuries that cannot be detected with modern, with the technology we have today until after death. Which is uh, tremendous. And then on this operator syndrome scale, there's a few more things that sum up nicely this idea of a holistic approach. And when I say holistic approach, I don't mean natural. I mean viewing the body as a full system, an interconnected homeostatic system. There is uh, marital and family concerns, intimacy concerns, emotional and uh, sexual relations, toxic exposures and illnesses and cancers. So toxic exposure which is pervasive. Pervasive. Yeah. In it's, the, it's unavoidable. I know, in the yeah. general population and in 
the operators in particular. And just from your book, this is, uh, I'm just going to mention it here, toxic environments from chemical, industrial, residential fires, including smoke, benzene, toluene, carbon monoxide, natural gases, et cetera. Um, and, and that really is, uh, that's just one part of it. You have the chemicals that are in the uniforms that melt into the skin and the heat. You've got the radiological, the biological. We talk about burn pits, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that's a tiny tip of the iceberg. You've got the water, you know, the stuff that's in the water in austere environments. You've got all the, all the, uh, how many jabs did a, do soldiers get? You know, how many vaccines are they given before every deployment? Um, a lot. A lot. A lot of anthrax uh, is, being, lot. Uh, is being used there. For And then, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, first responders. You know, they're going, firefighters and, and law enforcement often go into buildings where things are burning and they don't know what's burning in there. They don't know what kind of chemicals are, are filling the air in there. And they may or may not have the right type of equipment um, handy when they go in. Firefighters off, you know, typically do, but uh, law enforcement generally don't have have breathing and and um, protective suits. I'd like to thank Element for sponsoring this podcast episode. Element, as you've heard me discuss before, is an electrolyte packet that you can take anywhere. It is really important to replenish electrolytes if you sweat, if you are doing all kinds of activities, and quite frankly, many people don't get the magnesium and potassium that they need. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. There is no coloring, no sugar. These taste amazing. I sometimes will put them in my sparkling water or I'll put it in cold, ice cold water, drink it up. It has helped me eliminate headaches, muscle fatigue, muscle cramps. If you are struggling with any of those things, I encourage you to check it out. Right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. Go to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. That's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash Dr. Lion. And by the way, Element offers no questions asked refunds. If you don't like it, then you will get a refund. But I guarantee that you will, and you will be a huge fan just like me. And if someone was listening to this thinking, wow, I've probably really busted up my head. You have a list of questions, uh, uh, some things that you can do right now. And then, interestingly, you go to blast exposures. Blast exposures, you had mentioned this shearing force throughout the brain and body, which also, by the way, can contribute potentially to infertility. Because the shearing forces to the brain, there are blast exposures that can actually affect um, testicular function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Pituitary is in the brain. Yeah. Pituitary gland is in the brain. Yes. So you mentioned here uh, alcohol and drug use. And I'm curious as to why you put uh, under blast exposures, alcohol and drug use. I mean, I, I, I think I know the answer, but I, I'm curious as to is the reason that you have those questions because that would potentially compound the impact oh. of a uh, initially or initial insult of a damaged brain? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. And part of the answer to this is when you look at occupational specialties that have high danger and high risk and high uh, adrenaline and cortisol, and I'm talking about first responders, soldiers, you have a drinking culture frequently. And, you know, in the in the military special operations, it's, it's almost a, a competitive sport in, in many ways. <laughs> Um, and for guys who don't drink or don't want to drink or prefer not to go as hard as the others, it, it can be, you know, there's, there's a, there's a cultural pressure to, to be part of the group. So we see really, you know, a lot of at least history of prior heavy, uh, heavy use. And what impact does that have on the brain? Well, um, it depends on the substance and it depends how much of the substance and it depends on the when and the where, uh, I think. One of the things that I think maybe I should say is most people 
who are getting into a career in the military or, or as a responder are under the age of 25 when they start and the brain's not even fully developed. So there's a, there, there is a, a vulnerability uh, uh, for the youth, for young adults that, that their brain isn't even built out yet. They're not fully, my, the, the neurons aren't fully myelinated. The glial cells aren't all there yet. So any of these things we're, we've been talking about at a young age are gonna be especially harmful Chronic alcohol use, um, chronic binge drinking, uh, which could be you know could be tightly packed into just a few short years, or it could be spread out over you know decades, has a profound impact on on the brain, um, leading to you know Korsakoff syndrome, which is a deficiency of of B vitamins, I, I think. Yeah, and, and, and what and, is the? Do you remember what the the um, what it looks like in clinical practice? Dementia. Of course, yeah. Of course dementia. Mm -hmm. Dementia. We're talking about dementia. Dementia begins very early on yeah. in life. Yeah, it can. Yeah. It can. And it doesn't reverse. You can you can slow and you could you could stop drinking and stop, you know, compounding the, the damage, but that damage, you know, is is generally been done up to a certain point. Um yeah. Hmm. You also mentioned Basically, you guys, if you're listening to this, we're outlining the potential injuries like traumatic brain injury and things to think about as you are beginning to make better choices. If you have identified yourself in this operator syndrome scale and or have identified yourself as someone who's listening to this, feeling like potentially you have anxiety, depression, you are not functioning the way that you should, there are a whole host of things that we're going to continue to break down that may be above and beyond this diagnosis of anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Basically, I want to walk you through the underpinnings, potential underpinnings of anxiety and depression, PTSD, into something more, also known as operator syndrome. And we should probably come up with something for the general population of what we would call them. But while they seem separate, there is things to be learned. There are things to be learned. There are through lines. It, I, I, the, the phrase I use is taking a whole systems approach. And, and that's maybe more of a philosophical approach to saying we, we want to understand allostatic load. And can you define allostatic load? Allostatic load is a, is a hypothetical construct that, um, not specific at all, that it just, it, it represents everything that, that has landed on your shoulders throughout your life. Um, so that's the, that's the stress, that's the, um, the, the in physical and, and brain injuries, that's the, um, losses, the you know the soul crushing experiences that many people have. It's the the fear and the disappointment and the and the the sadness that often goes with life. It's 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 a hypothetical construct. So if we if we were to take a a firefighter for example, we the Alice and try to just think about the allostatic load from this week. It might be um, there there was stress of you know twenty calls. And each call was individual and different and involved something. Some of those calls came in the middle of the night. So there was sleep disruption. Some of those calls maybe were kind of fun and you're joking, but some of those calls involved maybe saving a life or maybe not saving a life, maybe a, an un, maybe responding to an unresponsive child and not being able to revive that child and having to sit there and, and either hold that child or sit there with the, the parents of that child. Um, it might mean you you bump your head. Uh, I mean, it includes everything. So it includes that bumping your head when you you know when the truck hit a you know hit a pothole. It includes going into that burning structure and twisting your knee. It includes um, um, getting further into that structure and inhaling some kind of mystery smoke of what you don't know what it is if you're not if you weren't prepared and, and covered up. So it's everything. And then it involves going home and, 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 and being in a bad mood and getting into it with your spouse and having a, a screaming knockdown argument about that. And then looking at your, your bills, you you don't have the money to pay this month's, you know, whatever bill. So it's all, it's all of that. And that's allostatic load. It's not nothing specific. It's just the load that we carry. I have a question about allostatic load. I struggle with this idea of stress because you know, looking at some of the data from Ali Crum's lab and, and just some of the stress physiology 
it seems to me that humans are highly suggestible. So just hear me out. Hugely so. Yep. And that when we are taught that whatever that feeling of stress is, for example, a child doesn't essentially know mm -hmm. they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. When we are taught that this impact, whatever that is, mm -hmm. is, oh, I'm so stressed. It seems as if it's reiterated over and over again, this fight or flight response. And it seems that it is largely taught is pervasive. And because of that, this idea of allostatic load I struggle with, because if in fact stress is a subjective experience, right? We have one word to define stress, whether you uh, spill on your white sofa or you go to the DMV and you forgot your paperwork versus yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to revive a child or losing your job or losing a teammate. We have one word to define yeah, yeah, stress. Yeah, yeah. Some people are better and interpret things differently. I'm with you. I'm 100% with you. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And I mean, so I, I really wonder you know, it's not just a fight or flight response. There's tendon befriend. We have many friends that elicit a courageous response as their go-to. Is this idea of this pervasive stress world that we live in maybe somewhat incorrect? Or uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so I, I want to be really clear. I don't think we live in a pervasive stress world. I think some people do believe that. I don't see it that way. And um, so- let me separate the discussion of allostatic load and the discussion of stress. So allostatic load are, is all the things that that have landed on you. Now, my, plus the things you do or minus the things you do to mitigate that that load. We have we have uh, as humans as in our society we have in many ways we've trivialized the word trauma. So let's start there. What is a trauma? And um, I don't know many guys from the military special operations community who will say I was traumatized by my service. I don't know one. I don't know. Any, yeah. yeah. I'm sure they're out there. Yeah. I, I don't actually know one. For the most part, I, I don't either. Um, like I said, I, I don't see PTSD. I don't see the fear reactivity or the avoidance. I don't see a, a hesitancy to, to talk about their experiences with somebody who they feel comfortable with. In fact, the first time I ever gave a guy a, you know, the, a short PTSD questionnaire and he returned it to me. I was like, oh my God, you got PTSD. And I'm like, what's this about? And then, then you have to go, well, what was your criterion A trauma event? What were you thinking about when you completed this scale? His divorce. His divorce was the single worst thing in his life. And I've heard that over and over again from guys. It's, it's, it's not what happened overseas. But can, let's talk about society, you know, very, very well- uh, known book by Jonathan Haidt and and Greg Luke Luke I'm not sure how to pronounce his name Luke Lukanov, two social psychologists I believe I think they're both social psychologists called Coddling of the American Mind. Mm. Coddling of the, the coddling the of the American coddling Mind of the American. Mind. So when when I was a child um, in the 19 when I was a teenager in the 1970s, I, I had a, what I what would be considered a normal childhood for that day. I walked to school. It was a 45 minute walk. Uh, I, I played a French horn, which was a bad choice. I, <laughs> I carried the French horn to school. Walked home. My back hurts just thinking about that. I got home from school and there was a stack of newspapers there for my paper route. Um, so I did the, you know, walk the neighborhood and through, through papers. Um, then I would get my bike and I'd ride over to my friend's house and then we would ride down to the to the park and we'd be throwing, you know, a ball around. And when it got dark, a bell would ring. My mom would be out on the porch ringing a, a great big bell as a signal it was time to come home. And we would take our sweet time and we would go home. Uh, we were just on our own all day. Um, didn't have any structured activities, didn't really have any supervision at all. Nowadays, children, young, young from basically from until they leave home, have every moment, moment kind of structured for them in a lot of ways. They, their parents run interference, their parents hover, their parents supervise. Um, so the, the, the idea of the coddling of the American mind is we've stopped allowing young people to have the stress inoculation. That phrase stress inoculation is, is an old psychological uh, concept, which essentially said in order, and it's 
just exactly what any inoculation is. To prevent you from the flu, we're going to give you a shot with just a little bit of flu in it, and your body will develop antibodies, and you will, it, you will get stronger, and you will be able to resist the flu uh, when you encounter it in the, in the real environment. So it's an opportunity to develop uh, resilience or yes. durability yeah. against yeah. the thing. Right. So you get a little bit of a little bit of stress, a little bit of failure. I mean, failure is a really critical learning um, experience. And if we don't allow people to have that that failure, that disappointment, that um, inability to achieve something that they thought they wanted, if they don't get little doses of that constantly throughout their youth, they get to college and they perceive college as being completely stressful and overwhelming. And um, I love my students at the University of Hawaii. They're good. They're really good people. Um, and you're still a professor good now. Kids. Yes, I'm still a professor. I still teach at undergraduate students. And but but one of the things that's that's clear is they all have they all that's not fair either. Probably the rate of anxiety is somewhere in the forty to sixty percent. That's a range. lot of anxiety. Oh. 40 to 60 percent? I think 40 percent are diagnosed with anxiety disorders. Um, 40 percent are probably taking psychiatric medications. Most, many, maybe a majority are receive psychotherapy or have received psychotherapy. I mean, psychotherapy is great and important to be able to, to talk through, but that amount, uh, those numbers are staggering. Staggering. They are. And when you talk with students... And, you know, at the end of every semester, I get the, hey, can I have an extension on the deadline? Could I take an incomplete and finish this next semester? Um, students are, and then you will, will, it's been a really hard personal semester for me. Well, what, well, what's going on? And it's, and I don't want to minimize anybody's suffering or struggles. No, no, that's not what we're doing. Yes. But, but it's, it's rarely something like, you know, it's, it's usually things like, um, some financial problems at, at my parents' house. Uh, my dog died. Um, my mom is being tested for and evaluated for some illness without even having results back yet. Um, there are things that that um, we wouldn't have recognized as 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 highly stressful things thirty years ago. How do you feel that we can? Uh, how can we work towards stress inoculation? Um, it's interesting because the operators don't need really stress inoculation because they'll wash out. Um, it, they they wouldn't even make it to that kind of level. I think we both can well, agree. Well, selection and training is inoculation up to, yes. to a certain point. I mean, it's part as basic training. Every soldier in basic training, uh, here's a gunshot, here's an explosion. Um, at some point, they're crawling through the mud with wires over their but head. But I'm telling stuff. you, I, I do believe in many of the, it's interesting because many of the operators would disagree with me. I, I, t I truly believe it is not cultivated. It's cultivated up to a point. But they are they are born different. Well, of course, genetics, our DNA has a lot to say about who we are and who we become. No question. But it's interesting because you talk to the guys and they will say, no, no, it's his, this was trained in me. I'm like, no, brother, this was not trained in you. Well, but it, it has to be both. Yes, it likely both. Everything is both. Nur nature, nurture. Yes. So we need we can't really directly affect the nature in, in the sense of genetics, but the part that we do have some control over is the Is nurture. that true? Do you think that if there's this whole conversation, and I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole, but I, I have to bring this up because it is top of mind. If we are creating, if we are coddling the American mind and we are creating generational softness, mm -hmm. then- I can imagine they are highly stressed, not inoculated to stress, and then they grow up to become adults and have children. And your students, forty to sixty percent in their you know late teens, early twenties, are now high anxiety. They all have children. I wonder if you believe that there is an epigenetic sure. passed down to another generation that then becomes softer and weaker and experiences mm -hmm. this allostatic load that is exponentially higher than, you know, you would look at and go, you're stressed about this? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, th that's a definitely a worthwhile perspective to consider. I don't know that we have clear data on it. I mean, we know there are epigenetic 
epigenetic changes, meaning the ways in which genes are expressed can be affected by exposures and experience. There's no question of that. Predicting that is, is, is we're not there yet. We're not able to predict it. If you but, were to give, not to interrupt, but I, I'll, I'll let you finish. And then I, I, I wanted to hear your advice. So just think about the culture on campus, trigger warnings. A trigger warning is warning you in advance that we're going to talk about something that might scare you or upset you. Hamlet gets a trigger warning now. Hamlet gets a tr Matthew, are you hearing this? Hamlet. Hamlet gets a trigger warning? Because they're su they talk about suicide. Ophelia die, jumps in the, in, the, in the river and drowns. What are we doing? Yeah, exactly. What are we doing? Uh, safe spaces. The whole concept of a safe space. I don't even know what that is. It's a, I don't either. It's a it's a safe space. I mean, this started, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I started noticing these stickers showing up on doors, professor doors, um, specifically saying this is a safe space for LGBTQ, meaning you could come in here and we don't you won't we won't hate on you or whatever. I don't know. And um, and, and I can appreciate that. That's but that should be a given, right? They shouldn't it should that shouldn't even be that yeah. should be a given. Yeah. And so if if I'm gonna if I'm saying to you if you're my student and and I'm the university, not not just me personally, but I'm the university, we have trigger warnings on things that, you know, like Hamlet. And, what did you think when that started and, and, been a professor for like 30 years? Oh, I thought it was uh it was fucking crazy. And I still think that. It's still fucking crazy. Um, if we're creating safe spaces and we have committees now on campus to create safe spaces, I mean, a lot of the entire DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion is, you know, the rhetoric um, is about creating, it, it's, it somehow is about saying the world is scary and it's full of hate and meanness. Words are mm -hmm. violence. That's another one you hear a lot of. So we're going to protect you from all of this. We're going to coddle you. Now, what happens when people get out of? Let's see. Out of the university, they're in trouble. How are they going to function? How are they going to function? Because I, I mean, maybe the world is going to have safe spaces and trigger warnings for everything. So, what do you propose? Again, what I also love about this book is there's a lot of um, protocols in place after each thing. So mm -hmm. I was just looking at this, um, you know, what to do for sleep. Etc. There is not a protocol here for uh, safe spaces. Yes, but uh, I guess a stress inoculation. Have you thought about that? Of what we can do for well, well I don't population. Think, I mean, yeah. we and and first of all, there are many parents that are really good at at stress inoculation with their children. I don't want to say it's across the board all, but. Children in many places, in many homes, are, are not getting the stress inoculation. The parents don't want to let them fail. Part of the problem is the perspective of public education as well. Hmm. Every child gets a prize. Yeah. For you to come in, for your child to come in second place, that would be hurtful to that child. So we're all going to, we're all going to get a prize. Everybody has a first place finish. Yeah. No. You hear <laughs> things like this. Um, I have friends who, who, when they first became parents and their children became, you know, six, eight, 12, have expressed they feel so much pressure not to let their children be allowed to do anything on their own because the other parents condemn them. The other parents shame them. Um, you know, it's it, 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 on one hand, I feel like the operators will always maintain a level of durability, but I can't help but think, um, are we also going to make less resilient operators? I I hesitate to say that, but I wonder, you know, and as I'm looking through this list, when you're evaluating somebody, do you think that there is one thing over the other that seems to have a bigger impact? Let's just talk about from a medical aspect. TBI. I was going to say TBI. So we've got TBI, sleep, TBI, endocrine. Wow. TBI. Full stop. Full stop. Because sleep and endocrine functioning are really damaged by the TBI. Okay. Now, if I were, if you say, what are the three ingredients of allostatic load? I would say it's- I'd like to know. I would say it's TBI, like the physical things that are hitting and going through and hammering the brain. I would say it's the- super high operational tempo of both training and deployments where there just isn't time for a pause, time for a reset of the nervous system. Do you think that individuals need resets 
of their nervous system? I think people need time. Time to, I think people need downtime and, and different people need different. What does that look like? Could that be anything? Could that be Netflix and chill? Could that be uh, meditation? Is there, is there? Well, that's something kind of... I work on with my guys. Mm. The guys I work with is, is trying to figure out what is that downtime for each guy. But um, I mean, you, you, you sometimes, we, we sometimes hear about a, an operational pause where guys come home from a deployment and they get a week or two. Um, or a month. Or I think, a month. I think Shane, when he came back from Afghanistan, they uh, he had an operational pause. Yeah. Where they put him in a hotel. Maybe it was a week, two weeks, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Troops used to have. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, in, back in the, the old days. Back old, in the because Chris is old. I am, and I've I've worked with. If we want to include my great grandfather, tr- um, combatants of every war back to the Spanish American War in 1898. It's noble. It's noble service because you were not actually in the service. I was raised as a conscientious objector in the Quaker community. You were raised as a conscientious obdre- objector in the Quaker community. So you were raised in a Quaker community? In a Quaker faith. I mean, I okay. don't mean... Okay. It's not Amish. It's a, That's two different things. People sometimes com- confuse them. Hmm. My my father came back from the war uh, and he was, had a, as a physician, was very anti-war uh, in his views. Which and, I could appreciate, and yes, of course, who, 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 who nobody's pro-war, I, I, I don't think, um, and so when I was ten, eleven, twelve, every you know every every Sunday we went to the Quaker meetings, mm. friends meetings, um, and, it, and it was awesome. I loved it as a kid, and I still uh, have a lot of respect. I mean, I'm I'm fundament, I'm I'm Christ, not fundamental Christian. I am Christian, um, and Quaker is kind of wh- where I came from. It's a very low. Uh, there's there's not much structure. There's not like a uh, an authority figure. It's you're a bunch of friends that get together and have conversations every Sunday. And um, when I became when I turned eighteen and I had to had to register for the for the selective service, the draft, uh, I did have the ability not to. I had the because I because of my my life, you know my my years as a Quaker. One option for me at that time would have been to claim conscientious objector status, and I did have some conversations with both my parents and some of the elders in the in in the in the in the community, and I decided that I would uh, register for the draft. Um, so I did do that, but I but I never served after that, mm. and I went to graduate school in order to because I wanted to work with and help help. Soldiers. And you are and you are serving, um, TBI. Plus high op tempos high of chronic, operational tempo. tempo yeah, so, stress. so the three things: TBI, high operational tempo, and then the circadian dis- disruption. Tell me, what is that? What's circadian disruption? Uh, working at night, working in different time zones, jet lag Something is an that example. All moms go through. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. It, absolutely. Anybody that does shift work is is disrupting their circadian cycles. What impact does that have on health and wellness and the ability to deal with stress? Well, it harms it. <laughs> Specifically more than that is hard to say, uh, hard for me to say. Uh, I'm getting a little outside my my true areas of expertise and and I think it varies by individual. But if you're not if you're not going to bed and getting up at the same time of of day on a consistent basis, you're you're not getting your quality sleep. And you're, you know, we all have a circadian clock in our body, in our brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but we also have these uh, elements of that circadian clock in every cell in our body. My circadian clock is set to Hawaii Standard Time. So, so what time is it there for you? <laughs> so it's uh, twelve thirty-three right now. Uh, you should have tons of energy. Um, and uh, and then so, but but. But what does that even mean to say we have the circadian rhythm? Well, our hormones are entrained to do different things at different times. Our digestive systems are are entrained to do different things at different times. So if I'm knocking on doors or kicking in doors at, at two in the morning, my when I ordinarily would be sound asleep, I'm not functioning at my best, but I'm also disrupting all of these whole systems in my body. And when you work with the guys, it is very comprehensive. Uh, you and I both know um, a handful of people that you've worked with. They, we, we've shared some, uh, and we do share some we've, patients. We've shared and some clients. patients, yes. And we, and we work on a on a on a committee together that's trying to 
continue How to figure out. How fun is that? It's, it is so fun. Oh, it's a blast. We, we need, do need to talk about the health, op, the operator health index that's coming. Okay. Um, we will um, talk at, at about some that. Point. But yeah, I just do a little bit of this and have some conversations and then I send the guys over to you <laughs> and you do the hard stuff. Um, yeah, you guys are a real pain in my butt. No, just kidding. You guys can take it. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. We talk all the time about optimization. You can do a whole bunch of things through diet and exercise and proper sleep, but if you are not measuring the impact that it has on your body, you are missing out. Inside Tracker provides you with a personalized plan to improve your metabolism, improve your sleep, optimize your health for the long haul. Most importantly, it analyzes your blood and your DNA. You have to understand where your biomarkers are. For example, ApoB is a biomarker that is linked to cardiovascular disease. You must know these numbers. If you care about living well and living long, Inside Tracker is a easy way to get these things done. And Inside Tracker also offers tools for professionals. I know there are a lot of professionals that listen to this podcast. Inside Tracker Pro is a no cost platform that allows your clients to share their Inside Tracker analysis with you so that you can tailor their health protocols and training based on their results. Go to insidetracker.com. You get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just use the code Dr. Lion. Um, do you, now you do talk about supplements in here for sleep. Um, and basically you talk about a sleep environment, you talk about sleep apnea, which anybody listening, uh, whether you are male or female, if you are a woman who's gone through menopause or going through menopause, you should get tested for sleep apnea. Did you know female hormones, as they change, um, typically because of these changes in progesterone, et cetera, leave people at risk for sleep apnea. As you had mentioned, if you are young and fit, and let's just say you have over a 17 and a half inch neck, you should get tested for sleep apnea. If you have had any kind of head trauma, you don't have to be an operator, you should be tested for sleep apnea. Would you agree with all of these things? Yeah. And I would add, <clears throat> if you feel tired chronically, Thank you, sir. Get, yes. Get tested. If you are looking at your wearable uh, technology, whatever you wear on your wrist or, or finger to, 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 to track your sleep, if you see changes that, don't, that you don't understand, you should, you should consider talking to your primary care doc about, a, uh, about getting a sleep study. And then the other thing is just talk to your sleep partner. Two questions I always ask people is, does, does your partner ever tell you you snore loudly and frequently? And have they ever seen you stop breathing in your sleep? Yes. A lot of guys say, yeah, um, my spouse has filmed me not breathing. Always. I, you know how many pictures I get from the entrepreneur's <laughs> wives of the guys that don't listen? If you guys are listening, it is very easy to get tested for sleep apnea from a, just a very practical aspect. You do not have to do a sleep study. Insurance typically covers it. And uh, yes, I get a ton of videos, especially from the entrepreneurs, you know, partners, whether it's a male or female, usually the guys that they they stop breathing. So and you also covered insomnia, sleep apnea, periodic limb movement disorder. Mm. Have you seen a lot of that? Yes. And it, it's a really crummy thing. Hmm. Um for for people who don't know what periodic limb movement is, it's basically this, this almost this ins irresistible urge to stretch and flex the the muscles in your legs. Typically, it's almost like an itch that you have to scratch. But it's not restless leg. Restless legs is where you feel like you constantly have to shake your legs. Usually related to, I believe, some sort of anemia. We uh, iron. certainly iron yeah. deficiency yeah, anemia. Iron deficiency. But periodic limb movement disorder, because it's interesting that you put that in there instead of. Restless legs. So you chose common sleep disorders. Periodic limb movement disorder. Is there any relation as to why you chose that? Was that just something that frequently came up? Well, I hear the periodic limb movement, but but maybe I I, I probably don't understand either one very well. I'm not sure medicine in general understands either one very well. But I think of periodic limb movement as something that afflicts people in their sleep and disrupts the sleep, whereas restless leg is more of a day is more of around the clock experience but you tell me you're you're yeah i mean 
I don't think that it is super well understood. Periodic limb movement. I don't think I've ever diagnosed anybody with that, but definitely restless leg. And when you correct for the iron deficiency anemia and potentially whether it's electrolytes, uh, uh, I do see resolution. And I will also say anecdotally, I've seen ice baths seem to help restless leg. Right before bed? Or just any Just, uh, I usually don't have them do it before bed, but- Okay, cold plunge yeah. habit, yeah. I try not to space it four hours yeah, okay. towards bed, but okay, it yeah. seems, and again- Cold that, plunge in the morning is a, or in the midday would be a, a good intervention. And then a couple other things that you had mentioned, uh, melatonin, vitamin D, you had also mentioned avoiding nicotine products. They contribute to fragmented sleep, which I hadn't really quite thought about that, the dosing, because a lot of guys use- nicotine gum or pouches mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of people do because it is a it's a, a neuro would you say it's a neurostimulant Stimulant? yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some good evidence to actually yeah. it's yeah. support in brain function yeah. and i'm yeah, not, yeah. quite frankly not opposed to low dose nicotine i'm same I, same i but try neither not. is matthew he's got zin in his pocket uh, try just try not to use it uh you know before bedtime <laughs> right and and you know i have a former nfl player he just pounds the nicotine I'm like, do you use that before bed? He's like, yeah. And I fall right asleep. I'm like, oh, brother, we got to. People can think they're falling right to sleep, but they don't know what their sleep quality, their ar the sleep architecture is. And, and that's another piece I try to get folks to understand. Just because you're in bed with your eyes closed for eight hours and you think you've been asleep, it doesn't mean you've been getting quality sleep. True. You, you need that time in REM and slow wave sleep. You need two to three hours of that good good sleep. And then you move to hormones. Out of all of the things in the operator syndrome book, which there's many, again, this is a book that is, I believe that this book is for everybody. It is mm. for providers, yes, but it is also for, I, I know you, you may disagree, but the general population can get a lot of good information from this book, mm -hmm. because the book Operator Syndrome, it is talking about operators. It is talking about things that potentially the average person wouldn't encounter. But there, I would argue that there are more things in this mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. that the general population interfaces with. Yeah, yeah. That is frequent. So, and and the the yes, I mean, I agree with you up to 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 a, to a high to a strong extent. Um, for example, each of the chapters is really just written like the chapter on depression is a four, five, six page chapter that's written like a, hopefully it's a an easy to read practical guide to help somebody understand their own depression and what it means and what are some of the things that they can do about that. And, and then at the end, the, the part two of the book are, are the are the interventions. So most most people across the board know of psychotherapy and, and psychiatric medications, but they don't know about all the other type of interventions that have really just kind of come on the scene in the last 10, 15 years. And I had on my list here, is that, are you talking about stellate ganglion block? As one of them. Okay. Yeah. What are your top interventions? Because I do want to go through that. What are sure. What are the top interventions? And then I like to play this game, which is a yes or no game. Okay. And you can't say anything else. It's only yes or no. So tell me the top interventions. Stellate, ketamine, HBOT. Is there... Are there? Tell me your favorite. How about mm. that? Well, I don't want I don't want to be dismissive of ther psychotherapy and and, and psychiatric medications. So let's talk about the top three. You know, other than those two, um, I like to. I recommend people start like if you're hurting, if you're anxious, if you're having trouble sleeping because you're hyper aroused. Go get a stellate ganglion block therapy. What is stellate gang stellate ganglion block? That is a a very simple, very safe uh, procedure. It takes about, I don't know, you tell me, 30, 60 minutes, probably 10 minutes. It's a quick outpatient procedure that involves injecting a little medicine into the sympathetic nervous system, which can be accessed at the side of the neck. And so a little lidocaine or novocaine injected into that, into that nerve, it turns down the fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And it works almost immediately, like later that day or the next day. It has almost no side effects, a little face, facial drooping for a few hours. It probably is helpful for about 80, maybe 90% of the people who receive it. And they may need a few treatments. They may need a series of treatments depending on the extent of anxiety. And 
we recommend in my clinic, we recommend stellate ganglion block frequently, not just for operators, but those individuals that have high anxiety. Anxiety disorders mm -hmm. and PTSD, everybody can benefit from this. Um, spouses of operators. I just had a conversation last week with, with a good friend um, and his wife and was just like, dude, you, you go get a couple's massage. <laughs> go together to the, to the Stella Ganglion Clinic and do this. And you can do it on both. You can have it done on both sides you know, of the neck. And I, and I recommend that uh, too for, for really high anxiety. This is a medical procedure that's been around since the 1920s. I did not realize that. Yes. I'm just looking it up here. This is not a new, this is not I new. I did not read. So just for the, the providers listening, it's used for the treatment of, again of what Chris is saying, many medical conditions. Historically, it's anesthesia that's administered uh, around C6, C7, um, for headaches initially. I mean, that's for decades, for almost 100 years, it was used for headaches. Our good mutual friend, Sean Mulvaney, also a SEAL, now physician, essentially pioneered it when he was working at Fort Bragg. He he was using it, he and, and, and a colleague, Jim Lynch, and then there's Gene Lipoff. They were using this to treat headaches. And, they, and they're not psychiatrists. These are neurologists, anesthesiologists. We're using it to treat headaches and they noticed that in the days after the procedure, the soldiers, not only did their headaches get better, but they were sleeping better, they were relaxing, their spouses and families were commenting, you, you just seem so calm. And they were feeling calm. It just, it's just a re, you know, it just brings that anxiety, you know, from the not, from an, you know, an eight or nine or a 10 down to a, a four or a three or a two. And the ganglion is this group of, would you say sympathetic fibers? The the I'd have to look up. This is I feel like this is Gray's Anatomy quizzing me. Um, I never took Gray's Anatomy. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, just a psychologist. The, I'm not a real. Uh, uh, it is a. It's what we would think of as the sympathetic fibers in this sympathetic chain ganglion. So this is where we think about fight or flight. We think about um, our nervous system, epinephrine norepinephrine, et cetera, these excitatory neurotransmitters, and it's present in 80% of the general population. And so just, not 100%, which it, is interesting. It just turns that down, the volume down. And a concern that many people have is, is it going to dope me up? No. Is it going to make me groggy? No. It's going to make you sharper. You're going to concentrate and remember better because you're relaxed. And I have seen this work wonders. There yes. are, I, again, who is this for? This is for someone with anxiety, depression, PTSD. Um, someone who I would say potentially doesn't want to try medication. Yes. People think that this is right. a invasive procedure. It is not, although I will say, I strongly recommend that when, if you are thinking about a stellate ganglion block, which you can Google, I believe that someone should have a crash cart there. I think that there are some places that do without a crash cart. A crash mm. cart would be if there was any kind of uh, emergency, cardiac emergency, a crash cart yeah. has all those things. Yeah. Um, it's Don't. also used to treat cluster headaches, yep. stress disorders, intractable angina, so this chest pain. Mm -hmm. Really, really yeah. great and safe, and it should be under, whether it's ultrasound or fluoroscopy, so that uh, it's it's nailed. And it's easy to find. It's not easy to find in the VA. The VA does not offer it in most most of the the regions around the country. But you can look it up in a in a in the yellow pages or Google it, and you're going to find it all over your your town. There are um, there are also another place to find it are pain clinics. What is your threshold for sending or recommending it to somebody? So if I if I sent you a patient and I said. Hey, Chris, I want you to talk to this patient. I think that maybe they have X, Y, and Z. How fast would you, what, what would be your threshold? What you would look for to say, you know what? Let's, let's see how you do on a stellate ganglion block. Well, first of all, I think we, we probably would agree. There's not, a, there's not a, a lot of reason not to get a stellate ganglion block. But it scares people. It yeah. does scare people, the idea of having a, a needle in the neck. Um, but... If it's going to calm, if it's going to bring calm. So if somebody is not sleeping because of hype, anxiety and hyperarousal, if somebody is highly anxious about anything, um, certainly PTSD. And part of what I, part of what you have to factor in is what is their history of other treatments? 
and where are they in the process. So if this is day one, this is your first day of talking to somebody like me or you, and I'm going to say, Let, let's do this early. And let's get I, the sleep study. I think that that's a great idea. And let's get the sleep study. Let's mm -hmm. get the blood work on, blood testing, dusting. Let's let's get this scheduled and do it now because there's not a lot of reason not to. And there will be very quick benefits for most people. Now it's not a it's not it's not a, a full cure because most people who receive a, a stellate ganglion block do have a the medicine wears off and, and the overactivation of, of the nervous system can come back. It often does six months, 12 months later, but, and you can go back and, and repeat it. You can have it done again, but man, what a great way to start to feel better now. Immediately. Now, feel better now. And then you're going to do better in your therapy. You're going to do better uh, with, with any other intervention you, 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 you attempt. Uh, one of the things I like, uh, as an intervention is journaling, which uh, a lot of people think of as kind of hokey, but it's probably almost as good or in some ways better than psychotherapy, just sitting with yourself and putting some words on a paper. Combine the, the SGB, the stellate ganglion block with journaling or therapy, and you're off to a really good start, especially as you start to then figure out your sleep and your hormones. And when someone picks up journaling, what I have found it is it's very helpful in being creative. Mm -hmm. Do you just say, go write something or think about gratitude? How do you instruct people to to journal? I, I tell them, I take, you know, just be free form, right? Write what comes to you. Now, it's going to be in the context of I'm always having conversations with 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 people. So what are we talking about in our conversations? Is that, are there themes? Are there issues? Um, um, I had a, a conversation very late last night with a, with one of my guys and he's, he's in a, in a, in a pretty tough situation right now. And he may not have the ability to see his, his nine-year-old daughter, uh, much in the, in the, for the next few years. And so my, what I said to him is start a journal, write a letter to your daughter, uh, once a week or twice a week. I and, love that. And keep that journal and, and present it to her down the road when, when the timing is right. Just the, then she'll learn that you were thinking about her. She'll learn that that you were, what you were thinking about her, but also what you were going through yourself during this 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 difficult period of time. And, I mean, they'll give it to her when she's 10, maybe, but you know, when the time is right, you, you have it. Whether he gives it to her or not, just the writing of it, I think will- That's will nice. That's very therapeutic. Stelly ganglion block, journaling in a somewhat of a therapeutic way, maybe free form or a letter to somebody or thoughts to someone that you might ha not have access to. What else you got for me, my friend? Oh man, there's so many things. Your favorites. And, I, and, you, and, only, you, and, you only get to give me oh, top many? three. Top, where, where are we now? You're, we're at two. You we're get two. one more. One more. Uh, maybe if um, Matthew thinks, maybe we'll give you If four. I'm nice to Matthew. I was yeah. pretty, he, he, I was nice to oh, Matthew no, he's earlier. He's tough. He's like coming in here with all bags and uh, stuff. Ketamine infusion. Talk to me about ketamine. ketamine. What it, What is ketamine? Ketamine is a medication. It's been used in anesthesiology for a hundred years. Isn't that what um, Michael Jackson died of? Fentanyl. Fentanyl. Ooh, God, I got that one wrong. Mikey died of fentanyl. Whew. I think I wasn't there, but uh, I think That's it was a good fentanyl. Thing. <laughs> so ketamine is a is a is a tool. One of the tools within the field of anesthesiology. It is a hallucinogen, so it has psychedelic properties. It is it is commonly used if you've ever uh, been in an automobile accident and rushed in for trauma surgery. They probably gave you two or three different compounds um, to w to go with the surgery, and ketamine might have been one of them. You know, you might have had the Star Wars experience of zooming lights and 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 universes flashing around you. Uh, there's different ways of of using ketamine. Um, it, like I said, it's been in medicine as an anesthetic for, for years, decades. It's now FDA approved as a treatment for depression. Yeah, I'm looking at it right here. Ketamine is approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Um, it's also being used in the management of psychiatric disorders, chronic pain management. It's been incorporated to many treatments of uh, psychiatric disorders, such as major depressive disorder, mm -hmm. bipolar, post-traumatic stress, as well as post-operative and chronic pain management. Yeah. It does say ketamine infusion is not a first-line therapy. No, it's not. But that's not because it shouldn't be. That's because oh. the medic medical establishment um, and the insurance companies 
it's much cheaper to give you a prescription of Paxil. And this is what this is where I, you know, this is where I get into my my um I could get into a rant about how we do this, but but uh, you won't. <laughs> I want my patients and I want my I don't see patients. I want to I should back walk that way. I want the people who are patients who I'm consulting to and advising to get over to get well quick. Why, yes. why spend six months I agree. failing to treat you with mm -hmm. two different antidepressant medications that, that you have to be on for a couple of months? Then if they don't work, you got to transition to another one and you got to give at least that an adequate chance before the insurance companies will say yes to ketamine. But I don't know that there's a good reason other than that. So the thing I would say about ketamine is there's different ways of administering it. One is infusion. Uh, there, you, which would be IV. Yeah, that would be IV intravenously, and that's what I recommend. You could go through. There's some companies that will send you sublingual uh, tablets that you use at home and have. No, you know, no, no. Yeah, you should yeah. be with a. You should be doing it. The a right. medical professional. Yes, and it, and it means four to eight sessions. It's not a nine. It's not something you do forever. It's four to eight sessions. Each session probably is is you know ninety to minutes to three hours. Where you are, you sit in a comfortable recliner, and you have this the medication run through your system for a while, and then they remove it, and your head clears. And when your head clears, you, you go home. Yeah, you it, could it, you could do that every day for a week, and and get a massive effect. And pairing that with the stellate ganglion block, um, I, just a, a, a paper, a short paper I wrote with uh, Gene Lipoff, Doctor Lipoff, and I have a theory. He has a theory, and I just kind of helped him with this that. Stellate ganglion by its block by itself is um, is very powerful treating for treating the anxiety, and we think that it might this is a hypothesis treat, help tr stimulate neurogenerativity, so brain repair, growth of new neurons and dendrites and pathways. Um, that's being studied right now. I think there's some clinical trials. I think our our friend Sean Mulvaney is consulting or working on those clinical trials. We think I think the same thing about ketamine. I think ketamine has brain healing properties. Ibogaine does. We think there's some promising uh, evidence that the other psychedelic medicines do. If you do, if you have ketamine and it treats your anxiety and depression and, and mood mood variations, and it helps repair your brain, that's a that's a that's a double win. And then this is the other piece of our theory is that if you do them together, the stellate ganglion and the ketamine in the same week or in close proximity, same day, uh, that there's a symbiotic uh, benefit there. Interesting, interesting. And that is a rapid alleviation yes. of symptoms. And so ketamine works by blocking uh, what they believe is the NMDA receptor. Um, and this is a receptor in the brain, brain mood, cognition, pain perception. And it is thought to have a very rapid effect. I'm looking here, it says this, the symptoms, the improvement in symptoms can be within hours. Mm -hmm. That is very fast. And so mm -hmm. basically this is removing a blockade to living a life that is, I don't want to say manageable, but the symptoms of operator syndrome and the symptoms of just this coalescence of stuff, whatever it is, whether it's sleep disturbance, TBI, hormonal dysfunction, is... Um, pretty tremendous. Okay, I love that. Do I get a fourth? Do, if you want one, if Matthew gives us a thumbs up. Okay, we got a thumbs, thumbs up. up. Okay. What's a fourth? The, get one more. Um, the EEG guided version of transcranial magnetic yes. stimulation. Yes. yes. And you're friends with Dr. Eric Wong. Friends, Wong. and I work. I I do some work. I consult to 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 to, to his his group, and so. When I say I consult, I work on the data that they that they have collected. So I'm helping with this kind of with the They're scientific uh, work. Yeah. So just to just to say just to explain, do you want to explain? I'll let you explain. Um, basically, uh, the EEGs that are done typically will look at brain wave patterns. Whether you know in the the waking state, it will be able to show what kind of brain wave you're in. Whether you are in kind of a sleep state which actually happened to my husband because of TBIs, that mm -hmm. he was awake, mm -hmm. but there was a dysregulation in his brainwaves and he was exhibiting brainwaves that looked as if he was asleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's ways that tell kind of the, and I say this cautiously because I'm not a neurologist, 
but brain capacity, firing capacity, um, I, I, I'm certain I'm not explaining this in a way, but it can also show if an individual has had a TBI mm -hmm. or has had mm -hmm. uh, any kind of head trauma. Um, oh, do you have a picture in the book? No, keep go keep talking. I just want to. I want to. Um, I just want to find a data point that's that is in here. And the transmagnetic stimulation is very good for many things, including, you know, oftentimes we mix up longevity and optimal performance, and, and they're kind of two separate things. Mm -hmm. This idea of optimal performance. You get an operator ready doesn't mean that he's healthy. Mm -hmm. You're getting him right. ready him to do the thing. Right. Um, and that could be with any sport, whether you're a CrossFit athlete, whether you're. Um, uh, a football player, et cetera. It could be anything. There is a divergence between high performance performance and longevity, and they, mm -hmm. they are two separate things. You could perform phenomenally for a few days or a week. <laughs> and just you're beat up. And you're then you're up. done, right? And um, so I, I only mention that to say that when you look at these EEGs, it's not necessarily all about optimizing performance. It really is about how do you resync the brain. Mm -hmm. Well, so I was going to back up a little bit and just explain transcranial magnetic stimulation (TMS). Also FDA approved for treatment of yes, depression. It it's been around for I don't know ten years or so. Um, at least FDA approved. I don't remember exactly how long, but the idea is they uh, position a magnetic coil next to your head, and it just buzzes a little electricity, a little magnetic stimulation uh, into one side of the head, and then it crosses transcranial. And it crosses to the other side of, of the of the brain. And our neurons function, they're all they're electrochemical. So electricity affects the brain. And you have um, you, you have about 30 sessions of this where you sit in a chair for 20 minutes and this thing just buzzes. We I think we have now improved this treatment with uh, what's called MERT. Uh, it's magnetic e resonance therapy. Which is the what you just described is the is the e, where they do EEG readings first to help you know improve the precision of the intervention, and and we, we've got really good outcomes now looking at op, special operators um, who have gone through the treatment and the, the um, I think I'm not fully read in on this but I think some of the the, the special operation branches like maybe Air Force, are starting to look into using it as a prophylactic mid-career, not, not waiting until, oh, now you're retired, now we'll fix your brain. But That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's low side effects. I mean, the only real side effect of it seems to be like you might get a little rash at the, at the site, um, a little, you know, a little skin irritation. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's cool stuff. I'm going to ask you, uh, yes or no questions, okay. just for fun. Okay, and you, you can't fun. explain it. Are, the, are are there right or wrong answers? No, or, okay. these are all. Um, this is like a psych psych test. Isn't this fun? Psychological. Okay, test. but I'm the psychologist. <laughs> so do I get to do I, yeah, yeah, do no, I no, get no. to do this back? No, you can. You can. Okay. Yes or no questions. Alcohol. Yes. Vacation. Yes. Scrolling on Instagram. No. Down the rabbit hole of the news. I want to explain my. You're not allowed to. It's a yes or no only. Yes. Medications as first line treatment for depression. No. Medications as first line treatment for bipolar. Yes. The use of. Bipolar one or bipolar two? Let's clarify. Bipolar one is. Yes. Okay, so for the, the listener, bipolar one is an individual has to have been hospitalized, right? Is that the, remind me, the definition? Well, the no, the distinction is, um, I mean, that's commonly what you, you end up with, but the, the bipolar is just, you've got two poles. One, one pole is, is severe depression. The other pole is mania, which, and then the, the person with the disorder has, epi has periods of time, as in weeks, not, not, you're not manic in the morning and depressed in the afternoon per se. Mania is is a very serious. I mean, it sounds like great fun. I mean, when when you're people who are in a manic episode are, feel great, they feel wonderful, and they do invincible. Not like, oftentimes, do not like to be medicated. They don't want to be medicated because they don't 
need it. They feel great, but they they are prone to gambling sprees, spending sprees, drug sprees, crime sprees, promiscuity, sex sprees. Mm -hmm. So then when they come out of that manic episode, you, oh, do, you don't you only get a yes or no though. But you were to, okay. <laughs> so Medic yeah. medicine for bipolar one, yes. Okay, medicine for bipolar two. Yes. Okay. Trick as as the as first line, but different medications. But different medications. Okay, fair yes. enough. Um, do you have one more you would like to add, Matthew? Jumping out of an airplane, yes or no? Yes. Not, okay, so you still think all these things are good things to do with the parachute caveat. <laughs> But interesting, um, early cancer detection yes. screening. Routine blood work. Yes. That's it. Those are my yes or no questions. Did I pass? Yeah. Uh, these were just, we always, uh, we're starting to ask yes or no, like rapid fire questions. Okay. Because people often, and again, it does, it pulls it out of context. Yeah. But uh, I hey. think that it's, yeah. you yeah. know, like if yeah. your feet were held to the fire, I agree with you. Medication for bipolar one and two. SSRI, uh, maybe for depression is not the, or medication for depression might not be the first line. Um, but I, I just like to hear, yeah. just all fun and games. Okay, you ready for my questions? Do, uh, is it yes or no? Does he get to ask questions? I do. Okay. I'm a guest. Guests, guests never ask questions. Okay. Guests. Fair enough. As a guest. Yes, sir. I, I, it, Make sure we edit this out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Germ are, these, are these yes or no? Yeah, yes or no questions. Okay. Turnabout is fair play. Um, journaling. Yes. Uh, sex. Yes. Cannabis. No. Um, beer. No. Um, meat. Yes. Vegetables. Yes. Fruits. Yes. White rice. Yes. Brown rice. Yeah. Um, mother. Yeah. Father. Yeah. Now we're getting into the psychodynamic questions but um and those are all questions so these are questions that i would recommend so these are answers i would all give as a yes to my patients mm -hmm. and a yes to myself mm -hmm. there's not really a distinction mm -hmm. yes fair enough yes to that um are there any other things so there's a couple things that i, I really want to highlight i, I do just want to mention you know, as we kind of go through all this, this operator syndrome, this idea of early cancer detection, I do want to talk about the health initiative. Yeah. Um, if yep. you would like to yep. kind of kick that off. Yeah. You let's, and talk, I, yeah. let's talk about that because that's about to happen. That's really close. So, um, so SEAL Future Foundation, SFF, is a small foundation that serves uh, former U.S. Navy SEALs. And so it's a, it's a small group of people. Um, they have a health program. I've worked with the health program for for three years now when it was just one guy. Now it's three guys that work there. Part of what I like about the, the SFF model is if you're a SEAL, and, and by the way, I'm representing this as a model that other foundations and other groups could use across the board. So firefighters, responders, Green Berets, PJs, Mar Marine Raiders. I would, I would like to see this model out there for more to use. So if you're a SEAL, former SEAL, you call the, the number, you talk and you get, you know, you get an appointment, you talk to- Call the BAT hotline. Call the BAT hotline and you talk to another former SEAL. You're not talking to you or to me, you're talking to, 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 to a brother who, who's been there, who also happens to have a, usually a, a, a you know, a medic background. Um, we love Joey Fio. We love Joey Fio and Hoagie and David. And- and the whole SFF thing. And they they will have a whole conversation with you about many things. They do use the operator syndrome framework. Um, so they have stuff like this mm -hmm. that, they, that they will use. They won't prescribe, but they will educate you. They will talk with you about opportunities, about, you know, hey, do you know, have you heard about stellate ganglion mm -hmm. block? And, and then they, of course, have a, a very good national referral network, and then they pay to send they will pay for the care. Now, la two years ago, um, we decided, hey, we should have a, a whole, it shouldn't just be me and, and Joey as we were building up. We should get some real experts. <laughs> I'm just a psychologist who plays a doctor on TV. <laughs> so we created a, a health board of advisors and um, you were gracious enough to accept my invitation to join us. Um, and we have 
uh, multidisciplinary. So we have neurology, psychiatry, occupational therapy, advanced practice nurses, um, functional medicine. Um, we have uh, an amazing endocrinologist at the University of Michigan, Rich Aukus, um, who is both a clinician and a and a uh, one of the leading researchers uh, in the field. Um, I'm leaving people out here. Uh, we have Chelsea Simone from Hunter Seven. I love which is Chelsea. One she's, of the, mm -hmm. she is she's a rock star in Hunter Seven. Just for everybody, Hunter Seven is the foundation that's looking at toxic exposures and cancers in veterans. So if you want to learn more, I, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of Hunter Seven and and donate money to them because uh, they're they're representing every you know all American veterans uh, on this space. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. Today, I would like to highlight creatine. We have heard about creatine for the last handful of decades, but let me tell you this. Yes, we know its impact on muscle cell volume and muscle health, but did you know that creatine monohydrate is exceptional for brain function? That's right. We're moving beyond just the muscle, but it also impacts brain function, but the dose required is actually higher. And I'm just going to throw this out there that the evidence suggests that roughly 10 grams of creatine is necessary to have positive cognitive effects. I think it's really important. And I love the fact that creatine can be used for muscle and at a higher dose can be used for brain protection, especially through aging. And even if individuals are not getting good sleep, if you're not on creatine, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Go to First Form, that's one S T P H O R M dot com slash Dr. Lion. That's First Form dot com slash Dr. Lion. Check out their micronized creatine monohydrate. It mixes so smoothly. And the upsides to this supplement are phenomenal beyond just muscle health firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. So if you guys are looking for your donations, I will put a link down here. Hunter 7 is doing such meaningful work. Uh, I don't think that we can talk about the numbers yet, but they yeah. are screening many people doing full body MRIs or so doing something called the grail or gallery test. Mm -hmm. And there are lives being saved. Yeah. Young lives being Young saved. lives that nobody would even know or never are would sick know. Yet. yeah yeah um and the seal future foundation also is a, is a wonderful organization uh to to consider learning about or donating to because they are i think they i think what they're doing is really at the leading edge of creating a model i mean yes they're they're helping the seals but what they're doing could be a model for other foundations and what we have done together you and i and our colleagues on this health board is we've essentially written a book <laughs> that isn't a book. It's a it will be be a website, a living website. So you you'll be able to access that. I think it goes up March 20, 20th, March twenty sixth. It's almost ready. I was in comms. So we'll link it. Yep, we'll put I that was, up there. I was in comms with Joey um, this morning, and it it is our collective work. It's a true collaborative work. It you can and you can use it in a variety of ways. So you. You could go and you could say, I want to learn more about this treatment. So what is stellate ganglion block? And you can go to that and you can find that. You could do it from a different direction. You could say, what are the treatments uh, for anxiety or PTSD or hormonal dys dysregulation? You could go there and then get, get link links to the pages that explain those treatments. And there will be links, not just, not just uh, here's art representation of it but if you want to really go deeper here are some podcasts that you could you could link to here are some um, some of the peer review research that's out there that you know I mean it's not going to overwhelm you but there will be resources to, to learn more so it's really just an educational tool um, that that we we've put together and we'll we'll continue to update it on a regular basis and it's out there for everybody it's there for the world so uh, that's the cool thing I, I love what, what what SFF is doing there it's amazing. Chris Free, where can people find your book? And you guys, I strongly suggest you grab it. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. And I think, I know you have a website. I don't know if your book is on sale there. Well, you could, yeah. So my website is chrisfree.com. And that's, um, spell your last name, F 
F R U E H E H dot com. But even better, just go to the Ballast Books, B A L L A S T, Ballast Books website. You can order it direct from them. It releases March 26, so you can pre order it on Amazon now. Or if you pre order it from Ballast, you will get a, you'll, they'll send, they're sending them out now. So you could get it earlier. And, and if you care about a signed copy, they're also signed, they would be signed. That's incredible. I, I have my signed copy. You do. <laughs> and you've actually read it. I have read it. I sent you a PDF ahead of time. Yes. And, and, I'm not going to have you on the podcast oh, that's amazing. without reading the book. Well, most people don't read the but book. But this podcast <laughs> is not most people. This is a special podcast. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's really cool to have a conversation about the health. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a fan of, of, of your work. Um, I've, I've read your book and have recommended it to many people. In fact, it's recommended in my book. Um, uh, I saw that actually yeah. under the recommended reading. Recommended reading. I saw that. Read Forever Strong, which is a phenomenal book. I recommend it to my students. Uh, next semester, it's going to be on a, one of my syllabi for, for one of my classes. I do, a, I'll, I usually put like four or five books and allow students to have a choice, but they have to read the book that they choose. And then they have to go into the, to the peer review literature and start pulling out studies oh, good. and they have to write a paper making an argument, whatever argument they want to make. Wonderful. But, but, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, good, because it's going to toughen them up and there's a ton of references in this book. So we're get to it. Yeah, yeah. But seriously, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. Um, it's thank you for having me. This has been awesome. It's inspiring, and I think that you know, there's quiet professionals behind the scenes, and there's quiet professionals behind the scenes in in a multidisciplinary approach in many different occupations. Mm -hmm. We talk about the quiet professionals in the military. And I truly feel that you are a quiet professional in the mental health space that really transcends beyond mental health. And I have so much respect for you. And I'm just so grateful for everything that you do for the guys, because I, I can call you and it's not like if you will talk to them, it's I got it. When is it following up like that? is extraordinary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your support and for having me here. I really enjoyed this conversation because, you know, I've done a number of podcasts in the last, you know, recently and well, over the years, and it's rare to have a podcast with somebody who's as knowledgeable and as um, educated and as, as experienced as you are with, with uh, the science of the science and the clinical wisdom that you have. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful that you shared. Yeah. Thank you.